All right, welcome back to uh, another episode in our series of, uh, of the reviews of our free, now well-known um, oscilloscopes. And I have planned to spend one episode on specific analysis, like mask analysis, body plots, perhaps power analysis, etc., on these devices. Now, for each of these topics, I think there's so much to, uh, to talk about that I, I, I picked just one for today, uh, which is both um, analysis. Um, and there will be separate recordings on, on the other analysis that I would like to take a, a closer look at, um, at later again. Um, so, um, both um, analysis or, or frequency response analysis, uh, how they're called, like, um, they're named after Hendrik Ware Bode. Um, and I can pronounce that in, in, in Dutch, he's an American with, uh, with Dutch ancestry. Uh, he was one of the directors of the, um, the Bell Laboratories and he played a significant role in, in aerospace research and he's also applauded together with Claude Shannon to, to have developed some of the fundamentals for our, our modern understanding of, uh, of telecommunications and the information age. And so one of the things he has contributed, and that's what it's going to be about today, is that if you have a circuit with an input and a, uh, an output, then the uh, behavior of that circuit basically can be characterized as a, a response function between uh, of the output to, uh, to the input. And that's exactly what a, um, a both analysis and a result both plot are, are going to do. Um, and for those that have not uh, already digged a little bit into that, it's a pretty straightforward methodology. Um, we'll use a, a device under, uh, under test, we'll provide an input to it, which is a, a frequency, we can be swept along a range, and we measure the output. And this way we characterize the response in terms of both gain and in, in phase of that uh, device under, under test. So we're analyzing the frequency response of a system. We do that by sweeping a sine wave across a range of frequencies into the dot, and we measure the input and the output of that dot. And so these two parameters that we looked at can be graphed in a, um, can be plotted in a, in a graphical way, and that is then the well-known Bode, uh, or Bode, I'm not exactly sure how to best pronounce it, uh, plot. So all of our free oscilloscopes uh, offer Bode, Bode plot functionality as a, as a build-in in, in application. Um, and if we look very quickly at their main specifications, um, we will see, and I'm just focusing here on the main differences, uh, we see that uh, the Roden and Swartz and, um, and the key side uh, can analyze a, a, a dot with, um, with one single output, um, but the SDS allows us to do both plots uh, simultaneously for three different outputs. So we can look at three different points within uh, our device on the test, or perhaps look at three different devices on the test at the same time and look at the differences into them. So we're going to look a little bit more into that feature when I'm doing the doing the experiment. Um, we see on the sheet also the, um, the frequency range that the devices support, um, and we see that the uh, Siglent has a significantly wider uh, frequency range, but I'll already tell you right now there's a KV with that, and, and I'll come to that later. Um, then we see that the, the Roden and Swartz and the Siglent have a bit more advanced functionalities like, uh, like amplitude zones, um, and the Siglent is the only one that offers automated measurement functions on the body analysis that have been performed. Now we're going to dig much deeper into each of these functionalities. Uh, certainly this is not all, and um, as you might already have seen, there is a separate document by now I think 50 pages comparing these documents, and there are like a, uh, two pages that go into great detail about the implementation of the body plot analysis in these devices. So go and look into them if you want to know any particular details. Um, maybe I should also add that the, uh, the, the, the Keysight oscilloscope, um, at least when I purchased it, was shipped with a, a little test DOT itself. It's a, a, a little device that you connect right away to the signal generator of the scope and it has a, um, and let me look at it, it's, it's printed uh, a bandwidth filter and, um, and a low pass uh, filter here. So you can do some, uh, some little measurements on, um, on it. Um, 
I have the feeling that in the early days there was some discussion about the precise implementation and, and correctness of measurement result with the, with the key site, which I believe was fixed by a firmware upgrade. And maybe this is why they later want to incentivize people by, by offering this, uh, this little device. I'm not sure if, 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 if these scopes still ship with it or whether that was a temporary action or, um, or not. Now, what, um, what device on the test are we going to use for our test today? We're not going to use the one over here, but I thought I should focus my experiments more on the audio frequency range, because I think that is where these type of analysis on oscilloscope really come to life. After all, if we want to do analysis of much higher frequency, we will probably refer to a spectrum analyzer or a vector, a vector network analyzer. Um, but this type of stuff doing on audio frequencies, that is really something that's interesting to do with the oscilloscope, with the boat analysis function. Also because spectrum analyzers generally do not get down at all to the audible range. I think my own spectrum analyzer, the FPC 1500, only starts from 9 kilohertz, and, and at that low frequency is not a very practical instrument anyway. So it doesn't cover the audible range at all, um, while these Bode plots on, on oscilloscope certainly do. So I'll be focusing on, on audio equipment. And originally I wanted to pick up one of my larger audio mixing uh, desks, but, uh, and that one also has like uh, several parametric IQs, so we could be looking into those and the actual Q factor that they have. Um, I was not in a position to, uh, to do so, so next I considered to use the, 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 the digital mixer implementation that I most often use nowadays um, at home. It's a software-based implementation. Um, and that one also has great functionalities. We can have up to five fully parametric uh, equalizers that we can configure. It will be great to look into. Um, but as a matter of fact, when I started to do some preliminary experiments, I already saw, um, even when I put the, uh, the equalizer on bypass function, that I would have far from a flat response in terms of, um, in terms of phase. Actually, we would have phase shifted all over the place, probably because of the DA and the AD conversion processes. And it's not that I was using such a bad D or D, uh, AD or DA, I was using these, these sound devices, which is a professional or semi-professional converter for use in the field. Um, but this is going to be a video about our, our measurement instruments and not about the device under test which behaves in a peculiar way. So I ended up actually doing the experiments on a small format um, audio mixer. It's, it's a Behringer here, also says Clark Technic, that's one of the greatest brands in audio history. Behringer perhaps less so, um, but the modern company of Behringer bought. Clark Technic and Midas and some of the very best brands there, so they're allowed to use that, uh, that trade name. But as it turns out, actually, this, this is really a, a very excellent device to carry out the type of measurements I want to do today. So we're, we're not missing out anything on not having other devices that we can use for, uh, for testing. Now, without much further ado, let's move to the lab and, and let's turn the instruments on and let's see how they actually behave when we try to do some real-life boat plot analysis with them. So here we are in the lab, ready to start some, uh, some measurements of the, the oscilloscopes. And I got my device on the, uh, on the test over here, the mixer I, uh, I showed you earlier on, and I connected it up to the oscilloscope. We'll start with the, uh, with the Roden and Swartz, uh, via the regular way of, of wiring up that we saw in the diagram. Now, first we need to think a little, of course, a little bit about the, uh, the signal levels that we need to use. So in, in audio equipment, basically you have either minus 10 dBV or plus 4 dBU. That are the two regular line levels of signals that we're, we're working with. And, and right now I'm working with minus 10 dBV, uh, which is approximately 0 0.89, 0 0.9 volts uh, peak peak uh, signal. Now, in audio we have typically to work with a, a huge range of, um, of, of, of signals and being at that level it basically means there's lots of room below that up to the, uh, the noise floor um, and there's also a considerable headroom above that if you go uh, above that, that, that level. And in live sound you'll deal with a lot of unexpected situations that you're going to need that room uh, both in the, in the positive and, and the negative uh, way. Um, but, but, but it's best anyway to, to start always with the, uh, with the right reference level. So, so that's what we'll be doing. So I will be basically turning on here the signal generator in my scope. 
Um, the first thing I want to check here, let me see where it is. I'm going to put it at high Z because in, in audio basically we have like low impedance with the driver but high impedance with the input circuitry. So we're not loading it with 50 ohms like we regularly would see, you know, in measurement instruments. Um, that will impact of course the values I'll be seeing here. Um, let's take an audio frequency to calibrate our thingy 440 hertz. Um, and let's put the amplitude at 0.894. That is actually the precise value that comes with uh, minus 10 dBV. So now if I turn the function generator on, yeah, I get um, a sign signal that I feed into the mixer and that I'll see coming back uh, also on channel A of my, uh, my oscilloscope. Um, I've hooked up channel B of the oscilloscope to the to the output of the, um, the mixer. So let's turn some buttons and see if we can get some output. We can do something on the channel and we can get something here on the, the main fader. Yeah, there we go. So what we're going to try to do now, what we're going to try to do is what we call unity gain. So all the stages in the mixer basically would work at their, their reference level. They will be adding things up. So, so basically the channel would uh, neither amplify uh, nor attenuate um, before I actually uh, start to put the, um, uh, the filters in that I want to measure here. Um, and the overall output actually is not at zero. If I put it at zero it will be here and, and, I, and we see here that the output signal is weaker than the input signal. The reason for that is that actually the, um, the mixer has to add all these different signals up so it has to be configured in such a way that if we add up all the channels, well this is a very tiny mixer that not that many channels, but adding them all up at their, uh, their reference level that would result in, 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 in zero dB. So actually I would have to put a little bit up here to to get to get here to to about the same um, at about the same uh, same level here, um, yeah, that looks good. Um, but you imagine if you got really a huge uh, podium mixer like like dozens, uh, sometimes up to a hundred of channels, um, that can be quite of a challenge. How you design the gain structure and actually not all mixers in the past really had as a good a gain structure as you want them to be. Nowadays is way better with a small mix like this is not going to be a. Uh, a big issue. So we got the two signals here and I would also directly note here and let me move a little bit over here probably you can see it already a little screen. Right now we got no notable um, let's make it a little bit bigger we got really no notable phase difference between the signals in so it, it comes uh, comes out at about the same phase as we uh, we put the uh, we put the signal in. So now we're basically ready to uh, to start our um, our measurements and, and, and see whether we can make a body plot of it. Let me just get the little stand here out of the way. Okay, we are zoomed in on the uh, on the RTB and um, let's go and see how the um, how the body plot function uh, behaves. So to, to find it we go to applications, we go to body plot and uh, what we get to see here is a small waveform display. Actually, we can make it a little bit bigger. We get results of the body plot, and we got an area over here where we're going to see tables, etc. I'm going to make that smaller. Now, since we're looking at um, at audio, I'm going to set the start frequency at 20 hertz. We'll stop at well, we could stop at 20 kilohertz. Let's stop at 100 kilohertz. We we'll see also a little bit how it goes outside the audible range and these are the number of measurement um, points and the measurement points are going to be per um, ah I made a mistake this is not 100 Hertz I wanted 100 kilohertz right because now we see also we're going to see our measurement in one two three four decades this is a logarithmic uh, scale as you will be able to see now the number of measurement points here is per decade so we can do 20 measurement points Per decade, it means you got 20 measurement points here, here, etc. So we got 4 times 20, that will make 80 points, I guess, right? Um, we want to set the, um, the level. I just did an experiment with it, but uh, he keeps his own levels here. So we're going to put it back to 0.9 volts as we decided, uh, you know. In our earlier testing, whether that will be all right. I think we set most of the, the right parameters. We have 
figured it properly the, uh, the inputs and the output channels here. So then we can run our analysis, we can choose repeat, so it runs on forever, reset and a couple of other things. Now, um, note by the way, we see 50 millivolts here and 50 millivolts here in the, uh, in the settings. I'll tell you later why. So let's just start get it going. And what we see now here is the waveforms that are very practical. We see it's going to go very fast, there are going to be 74 things and you know it's, it's, it's just a question of a couple of seconds. And well there was a lot of action going on, you might also have noticed here that the values here at the channels have changed. So we got um, automatic gain setting at our, our, our channels here, making sure that we don't end, into, end up into saturated channels or so. So it automatically sets the gain for the oscilloscope channels that are in use. Now well, we already see our results of our first analysis here. We see two lines, a um, amplitude line and a phase line, and the amplitude line looks uh, very very flat. Of course to know what very very flat means we have to know something about the scale. So let's look at the scale of the blue thing that is 12 dBs. Eh? So we see 12 dBs here different between these settings. Um, personally I prefer a scale of 3 dB per uh, division. That's what people in audio like to, to work with. Well, so we, we, we can easily compare the magnitude of a signal or power differences if we work in the power domain if we we're working with 3 and 6 dB step. Now the nice things about this oscilloscope is that you can actually change the scale just easily using, uh, I'm going to put it 3 dB, I'm going to bring it back into the picture because it went all the way up I think. Yeah, there we go. So now we got a, a scale of, um, of 3 dB um, per division, um, that of the phase here we got zero phase, here we got mi minus 180, well that's, that's fine with me, uh, the setting of those skills, but I could also just change them, I can also go here and do the setting via menu, but I could also do that directly here via the, via the buttons. Um, yeah, so also on this skill, you know, this, this looks perfectly fine, it's a very flat thing, you know, even a very affordable mixer has, 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 has a very flat gain. Um, performance and, 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 and not anything notable in phase. I mean here we're already outside the audible range here at 20 kilohertz. So nothing to be worried about. This is a very nice mixer device and we see that here on the, um, on the, um, on the settings. Um, of course this is when we look at the, uh, at the mixer device without any equalizer activated and we did this exercise to learn something about the, um, the equalizer. So what is happening for example if I use the um, the bass shelving, so if I take out lower tones with the, um, which I just did on the equalizer, and we run it again, and what we'd expect to see, yeah, we got less lower tones. Yeah, and now we see exactly what that equalizer is, um, is doing. Now we can um, invest our results a little bit more if we use here these, uh, these markers here down on the, uh, on the bottom. So let me put a marker, marker over here we see is, is roughly speaking 0 dB, so if I go to the minus 3 dB point, and that, that's around here, uh, then I would see at, uh, at about 400 Hz it, it dropped by, uh, by, 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 uh, by 3 dB. Uh, and so I can characterize the, uh, the filter that I'm, um, I'm looking at. Um, this was just uh, the low shelving filter, let me also activate the high shelving filter and thin away there and, and run the analysis once more. And now we see two see filters both on the low and the, uh, and the high side of the device. Yeah, again he's running the analysis. You know, all looks perfectly fine to me. Um, no, it doesn't look perfectly fine to me. I don't see a high shelving filter. Oh wait, I turned the wrong button on my mixer. Yeah, I corrected that. Once more. And, and no, we're actually running like 74 analysis in like 10 seconds or so. Yeah, so, so yeah, this is exactly the gain structure as we would expect it to, uh, to be. We can move it around a little bit on the screen. investigate a little bit better. Now I think here we saw the, the basic functionality, we see most of the relevant parameters shown right here on one single screen where we can easily um, adapt them. Um, we can quickly look at some of the more advanced uh, features. First of all these measurement points, of course we can select many more measurement points and we can go all the way to 
two and a half thousand measurement uh, points here on this, this device. Now this can be relevant if you want to do a analysis of a device, for example, that has a lot of sudden phase shifts and then you really need high resolution in your picture. We, we don't have that requirement right now where our mixer here, um, but being able to do high resolution measurement like 500 measurement per decade um, can be useful in, in, in that sense. Um, talking about measurement points, we can go to the more advanced settings and we can actually make the measurement points also visible. So we actually get an idea of how the graph was being built up. Um, and, and, and equally, when we go to the advanced menu, now we have a fixed amplitude of 900 millivolts peak peak. Um, but we can also choose basically to have what we call an amplitude profile. And I activate the amplitude profile right now and I can look at the configuration. I can make, for example, six points. I look at the configuration. And what we can do here is basically that for different frequency ranges, we can define different amplitudes. Um, and this would basically allow us to work with devices that are very sensitive or would really require different input voltages to, to, to test them across the range of frequencies. So to have a good view of that, I think I better turn off for a moment here the, the plots. And then we can take a better look here at the amplitude ranges that we were just talking about. I think we can see them just over here. We should be able to amplify them a little bit like this. Yeah, here so you see some information on the amplitude ranges that I just had down in my in my profile over uh, over there. Um, so you see these steps here coming up, and let me see if you see all of them at six points. Yeah, they go from one kilohertz to one me megahertz, so I'm not seeing them, uh, all of them right now. Um, yeah, if I put my range to one megahertz, I actually get to see all of them. So you see here these different steps basically, and that is when uh, the, the dot is offered like different voltages, higher or lower, depending on the characteristics of your, uh, of your dot. We can have 16 different zones with this device in, um, in that way. Um, yeah, I, I think we just saw the, um, the major points here. We got a couple of other things in the advanced setup, but we don't have to go in every every detail basically of the device. We got two markers, we got a delta marker as, uh, as well. So it's a rather complete um, implementation here of uh, of um, yeah of body plots on the uh, on the RTB oscilloscope. Now let's investigate the uh, body plot on the um, on the Siglent um, oscilloscope. I also set up the um, the signals. Um, actually, we see see a little bit more connected now before, and, uh, and in a moment I'm going to show you why that is the uh, in the case. Um, yeah, so to go there, we go to analysis, we go to body plots, and there we uh, we go. Oh, we got some old results. Actually, the uh, we see over here we see the graph showing up. We got the settings to the on the right hand side of the uh, of the screen here and first we'll turn to the uh, configuration of the body plot. So the first thing we're going to see here and that is actually a, a very exciting thing, we actually see the three different device on the test outputs. So instead of just measuring one output like the Roden and Swartz and, and later on also the, the key side will be able to do, we can actually configure here multiple um, yeah, outputs or multiple devices that we're, we're looking at. Um, I'll, I'll do that in a moment. Let me first just look at the same scenario as we looked at before. Here we can actually also have the automatic channel gain we saw before, but we can also put it on hold. But if you do that, you're at the risk that the channel is going to be overloaded. Um, we're going to see some stuff about interfaces. I'll talk about that uh, before. Let's first try to get it to, uh, to kind of the same settings as, um, as before. What are the relevant parameters here? Frequency mode, um, decade. We actually can put it also to linear, but before we're on the logarithmic scale, so we're going to keep uh, being on the logarithmic scale, but this does allow you to go to a, um, a linear scale instead of logarithmic. Um, we wanted to go from um, for 100 hertz to 100 kilohertz, 
to run the same analysis as we just did before. We wanted to do, I think, 20 measurement points per decade. There we go. We wanted the amplitude to be 0.9 volts. We can also enter that over here. No offset necessary. Um, oh, load. We have to tell him that that actually there's, there's, there's no load, that we are dealing with a high load um, input. And oh, this, this is very nice, by the way. Um, it is continuous. You see that all the other devices can just choose basically between um, and, and, uh, between 50 and infinity, but here we have 50, 75, 600, which are regular values in, 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 in the audio world at least, but we can also put it at, at, at any other, so uh, yeah, um, 45 uh, or 56, I'm typing, uh, uh, kilo ohm. Uh, so you can, of course it uses this just to make a calculation to, so to predict the, uh, the input signal over the dot correctly, but I, I like the fact that we got more flexibility here than in the other devices. I'm gonna put it at infinity. Yeah, okay, that's here, this is just rotating all the way around. Now I think I set the parameters the way that I would like them to be. Um, also, I like very much this overview input screen. Maybe you remember my earlier videos where we were doing things like, uh, like serial bus decode, and there I thought the signal was really not very convenient, having to go through lots of menus with each like one parameter for, for, for a particular line or whatever. Here at least we get like a convenient overview menu of a lot of settings. I wish that the Sigland had that for many of its other applications as, uh, as well. Okay, now we, um, we're going back here and basically we should be able to run the, uh, the operation now. We're going to click here. Now it should be running. Nothing happening yet. Nothing yet. Yeah, I see something on the screen. And I see something coming very slowly, very slowly. Yeah, so as a matter of fact, I tried this a little bit uh, before and it's gonna go very, very slow. The signal is, 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 is painstakingly slow when it comes out at carrying out uh, this type of analysis. And the analysis I'm running right now is not even, you know, that many measurement steps. You really want to go up in measurement steps if you want to do a little bit more um, precisely. So I will, I'll just be turning now, I think, to, uh, to a lesser number of points per decade uh, just for the sake of recording this, uh, this video. Um, but I did a couple of, uh, of calculations in the speed of, of, of carrying it out and you see them on the screen right now and we see that there's actually a very significant speed difference between what the uh, signal is doing and what the, um, what the other device is doing when it comes to carrying out this type of, um, of tests. All right, now, so we got some of our first uh, results over here. Um, let's analyze that a little bit more and, and to do that uh, we can go to the settings here and we do that going via the, uh, the display settings. So here we got amplitude and phase uh, where we can go more into the details and as you'll note here actually I left it on, on the wrong setting when I, um, when I used it the last time. Actually here we can choose between different modes and the regular mode you would do is V out V in because that actually would show you the behavior of the, the dot. And, and, and mind you, V out, V in, that's not from the perspective of the scope, but it's from the perspective of the, uh, of the dot. So here we're really seeing the values um, and, and you, normally you would do them logarithmic, so we're back in our, in our DB skill. This is the way that we would, would like to, um, to see it. Um, we're actually also continuously running. I'll turn that off in a moment, but we see the little measurement dot going up and down again. Um, now, to get this in the, in the skill that I would like it to have, like with the previous device, I would like to have it as, as a 3 dB vertical uh, skill. So let's go there. It's not changing. Yes, it is now. Yeah, you see, that's not going to happen. 1, 2, 5, 10, 20, etc. I cannot choose 3 dB. It's only like a 1 to 5 sequence. This I find rather inconvenient because if you do a lot with audio stuff, you really want 3 dB, 6 dB, 12 dB type of skills, not this type of skill that we get over here. So that's, that's not super convenient. The, the reference level, however, you can set them in steps as small as point, 
0.04 steps or so. That's, that's incredibly small steps, you know, but I don't care so much about that. I care about the skill level, so I cannot really choose the, the skill I would like to have. Um, we do have auto scaling like with all the other devices here. Um, and I think I'll get back to that in a second. Also for the face part, um, this one we can actually not only put on degrees, also on radial if you have a need for that. I, oh, we cannot do that while it's sleep, sweeping. Well, that's, that's okay. I'm not going to try to make it do it right now. Um, here we have, I think, more, uh, more flexible scaling uh, options. And we have an auto set as well. Now the auto set behaves well, uh, but in several of my experiments of the last days, the auto set did not always behave properly. And, and quite often the whole, the whole graph kind of got out of the, the picture I was, uh, was looking at. So that is something you might want to be, uh, be aware of. That auto set doesn't always behave exactly in the way that you would like it to behave. Anyway, I think we saw the most important settings here when it comes to setting those things. Uh, we got uh, the cursors for sure. Uh, it's even a little bit more flexible than on the, uh, the Rodinus Swartz device. Um, I got a couple of cursors over here and, oh, I have to turn them on with the status bar. It, it, the rea it, it, it reacts very, uh, very sluggish, very slow, uh, much slower than the other devices. So here I got like a, um, a tracking type of, of cursor. We see it over here. I'm not seeing values with it yet. Why is that the case? Oh, because I got the wrong source connected with it. Yeah. Okay, so we see two tracking cursors, X1 and X2, and we, we can manipulate them, them separately of each other or the combination of X1 and X2. So that, that's actually like the, the road and swords, um, what's happening here. We also got a couple of uh, Y level cursors, but they're more like lines. They're not tracking really any value. They're more like lines that you can use to, uh, to draw on the screen and to, uh, as, as a helping um, tool. But nevertheless, they're there and they, uh, they work uh, well. Now let's, uh, okay, let's now use the Siglund and analyze two different uh, dot outputs at the same time because that's where it really gets interesting and it's the only one that can do that. So to do so, we go to configure and we have dot output two. We can hook to channel three and I actually already connected that to a, another channel of the uh, audio mixer I have here. All the other settings here, single sweep, 20 hertz to 100 kilohertz. Yeah, we're gonna stick at 10 points per decade because we, uh, it's going to be fairly slow. Yeah, this, this all looks good to me. So let's, let's simply go and, and run that operation. Again, it's going to take a while before it, it, gets, um, it gets going. Um, in the meantime, let me also point out, we see here a number of measurement values. Right now the measurements are not configured. Uh, we're going to look at that later on. Um, unfortunately, I don't know how to get it out of the way on the, on, on the screen. It's always there also when not, uh, not activated. So what we see now is measurement of two different channels of the audio desk coming in. Now I've set these, these channels on the, uh, on the audio mixer to, to identical values. So we should get something which is very close to each other. And actually if you look here, this is, this is, is, is only a decibel away from each other or so, these, uh, these lines. So, so this, this, is, this is very, very close uh, together, any difference that we're, we're seeing here. So, so this is really fantastic. We can look at two different dots at the, um, at the same time or at two different outputs or two different points within the same dot or so. I mean, this is gonna be a very useful function. Okay, auto scaling, that is behaving well today. Yeah, we see here more or less what we expected to see with, uh, with the device. And we see the fall off here. Yeah, we see it reskill. Yeah, so we see two channels that are very much um, alike. Uh, we also see their face uh, response uh, in case that we would just like to focus here on the, uh, on the gain and, and not the face. Um, I could simply go here, trace visibility, and like with the other devices, actually we can just turn the, um, the face points off. Yeah, there we go. Now we only see the, the gain uh, levels here. And now let me just, um, on the second channel, um, activate the equalizer on the mixer eh? because now both channels are neutral. So on the second channel, both the low shelving and the high shelving. Um, up, I set it and now we go. We're gonna wait again to see the graph appearing. And now within one single plot, we should be able to see the differences. Mm, I wish I even set it to less than, what was it, 10 measurement points. It, it, 
it's really slow. And the, the, the speed of the signal also, I think, depends on the number of, um, uh, of dots it's analyzing, which, which of course is a fair point there. Um, so I'll do a comparison sheet um, with all the different possibilities of number of, of channels activated, so we actually see how it uh, behaves that way. Altogether, it is very sluggish, the, the signal, and even its, it's uh, reaction to pressing one of the buttons, sometimes it takes up to five seconds before something happens. Um, but nevertheless, look at that, super, super good. Yeah, we just see it just hitting where none of the equalizer in at the frequency, and now we got the high frequency shelving thing coming in. Yeah, so this is a super nice, uh, super nice functionality here of the, the signal that none of the other devices had. Um, I think for this is really worthwhile to have the signal for this uh, this functionality here. Um, now let's look at a couple of other things. You might have noticed that um, that the moment that it stopped operation, we have this uh, print wave area, and if we press this, he saves it to a, a file on the device itself or to the USB stick if uh, if available. I, I got a little bit excited when I saw this because I was hoping that we actually get like a higher resolution print um, of this because. I mean, the shape looks very good. Looks better than the um, the Roden and Swords, I think. This is something that I will be, you know, happy to uh, to to copy and paste into documentation. Uh, I will be preparing. Um, but the graphical resolution is not so great. Unfortunately, the the print wave area is just exactly the same like taking a screen print and cropping it. You really get only the low screen resolution. It's not any higher than that. So it's it's not such a useful uh, function. Now, digging quickly into other functions that we got uh, right here, and I'm going to go back to the configure menu here. Now, wh wh one of the things, um, yeah, that, that I should discuss with you is the number of measurement points here, um, the, the maximum number of measure points. On the on the Roden and Swartz, it was two and a half thousand. On the Sigland, um, well, the best way actually to get a good overview is to go to the linear view because then we can see the total. It's it's five hundred actually. Um, instead of two and a half thousand, so we we cannot do as many measurement points as we can do on the uh, on the other devices. Um, coming to some of the other functionalities, if you look in the spec sheets of the um, the signal, you will see that it can do both analysis all the way up to 120 megahertz. So that's like five times as much, six times as much as the other devices I'm looking at today. So that that will be really cool. Now. Let's try to see if we can do that. We go from 20 hertz or whatever it is to, now let's say maximum value. Yeah, and we get 120 megahertz. And let's run a Bode plot on that. So there we go, operations, 120. Wait, 120 changed in 50. It's gone, let's go back. Operations off, it's only 50 now. Let's go back to 120 maximum. Close. We see 120. Again, if we go back to the menu, 120. Yeah, so it will behave like uh, like that. It goes back to 50 and you use it. Now, thinking a little bit more about it, um, yeah, this is using the internal function generator, and the internal function generator of this device cannot at all go to 120 mega. So it's kind of impossible. Still, it's in the specs. Now, you can do wider frequency range analysis, but you have to do it in a, in, in, in a different way. You actually have to go and configure, and you have to go and connect a another device, basically, another function generator, a compatible signal uh, function generator, that would allow you to, to do so. And I, um, I did that. Let me quickly see if I can get that with my camera. Here I got this function generator over here. That one can go all the way to 120 megahertz. I'm going back to my Sigland screen here, and I see I moved it a little bit, but I see, hope it's still okay. Let me focus it. Yeah, I think we can see it. So I hooked it up. I'm going there via the USB interface. Test. AVG connected successfully. I'm at 120 megahertz, and I'm going to put on operations. And actually, my external device, I hear a click there, and I see there's something happening on that screen. And now I see here the analysis is running to 120 megahertz. Uh, and I actually see my external generator making steps now. I didn't connect it to the right output, it's still connected to the internal VG, so I'm, I'm not going to get any lines here. So yeah, you can do up to 120 megahertz, but you have to go and acquire a, um, a separate device. I, I, I think it's a bit misleading in the specs 
that they they mention you can you can do this without mentioning that you actually have to go and buy another function generator in order to uh, to do so. Okay, finally, there are two more functions I would like to explore here on the uh, on the Siglet with you. Um, so firstly, this is the possibility also to use amplitude uh, zones, uh, like on the, uh, the Roden and Swartz. To do so, you have to go to configure and actually is part here of what is called the sweep type. So sweep type can be set to vary level and then you can actually define a, a pattern. Um, and there's a pattern editor here and with a pattern editor you can use here, here notes in the in the table, um, so you can define them all. There are up to 10 points. The uh, Roden and Sword supports up to 16 points, um, but it will depend on your application if you actually need as much as uh, as 16 points. Um, the Siglet does have storage for multiple of these uh, sets, which they call profiles. So we got like B here, which is empty, and, and C, and we can back to to A over here, so we can store multiple of them. Um, I'm not going to run tests of them, but now you've seen that they are basically available. Um, the final function that I would like to look at here is the measurement functions and these are not present of any of the other devices. So what do we have for measurement? We go here and we see we got five different measurements including calculation of cut-off frequencies, both lower and higher cut-off frequencies and bandwidth. And I'm going to quickly demonstrate these three of them. So if we want to use them, here we got measurement positions down here. So measurement position one, Source number three, I'm going to take the lower cutoff. Measurement position two down here, source number three, because that's where I got my filter on, I'm going to take the upper cutoff frequency. And measurement source number three down here, source three, I'm going to look at the bandwidth. And you see the values already appearing here. So this is very handily showing me that the cutoff frequency here, so which is the 3 dB frequency here on, on, on the, the, the orange curve, is, 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 is 390 hertz. Um, the higher cutoff frequency, so 3 dB low here, is going to be 1.7. And the bandwidth, which in this case, of course, exactly the difference between the two of them here, is 1.3 kilohertz. So this is a very handy feature. It can calculate that automatically. Um, if anything, it would be nice if it would have had cursors or something that would show us where the 3 dB points are. Um, but having said, this is a unique feature only available on this device. I'm not going to complain about this measurement uh, functions. So I think this kind of covered everything I wanted to talk about with the Siglent and let's quickly move on to the last oscilloscope to see how both the plots are being implemented in that one. So here we got our, uh, our key side. I, um, I hooked it up in the, um, in the same way. So let's quickly go to the analysis body uh, plot. So we have to go here, choose this feature, go down to frequency response analysis. It's being activated. We go and see the menu. We got a setup menu over here. Um, I already set it at 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz. Let's have the amplitude as we discussed before at uh, 0.9 volts. The high Z output, 20 points uh, per, uh, per decade, that all looks fine to me. We can set the sources like on any of the other devices. All looks fine. Let's go and run the analysis and see what's happening. Yeah. So we do see the waveforms over the, the display. We still saw a bit of a distortion, but that is when I think he's sensing and, and trying to set the right sensitivity to the, uh, to the channel. Now we actually see it running. Uh, we see the two sine waves actually with, with little phase difference in it. The phase difference is getting bigger over time. Voila. Yeah, and that's also what we see in the plot. Yeah, also, also this one looks like a very clean plot. Nicely shows in um, yeah, the gain and the, uh, the phase versus the, uh, the frequency. Now, what we can we further do here? There are a number of things that can be editing the, um, the chart here. Did I press the right button? Yeah, auto skill that that already happened. Um, oh yeah, we are in the chart menu, so we can choose the, the the gain and the gain skill. So we can set it to the three dB that I would like it to be, and we can set it where it goes on the uh, on the screen, right? Um, 
we have a marker that we can be moving around. There's only one single marker, not two markers like in the other uh, devices, plus a delta marker. Um, it can track either the phase or the, um, or the frequency, um, or the phase or the gain, sorry about that. Yeah, okay, similarly uh, on the chart we have a setup about the, uh, the phase. I'm not going to go into a detail there. Um, a bit different from the other devices is that you can also go here and change the frequency of the charge in hindsight. So suppose if I only would be interested to look from 10 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz, I could do so without running a new analysis. Uh, and, and going here to 10 kilohertz. Um, the other devices actually the frequency was only set for the whole sweep and, and not after that. But here we can actually choose the frequency uh, just for the, the plot that we're, uh, we're getting here on our, uh, on our device. Um, and actually like this, yeah, of course there's no data there now because I'm, I'm dragging it uh, bigger than it, uh, than it is. Um, yeah, so altogether this looks pretty straight, um, straightforward. Everything works uh, fine. It's not as sophisticated as, uh, as the other devices, I would say, in terms of functionalities. We got no amplitude zones and um, the dual uh, cursors and some of the other more fancy stuff. Um, but anyway, it, it looks good. It's also a beautiful looking graph that, that I would be happy to put into a piece of, of documentation here, you know, just taking it from a, from a screen print. So it's, you yeah, know, it's, it's also a satisfying uh, implementation, I would say, of, uh, of body charts on this, uh, on this device. Now let's come to, uh, to conclusions and the first thing I want to say is that all these free instruments have a very useful implementation of body plots. I would have no issue with having to work with any of these three if I would have to, to carry out a task in this, um, is this domain. However, we do see some, some differences in, in implementation and specific strengths and, and weaknesses. Uh, which I will address now. And if we look at the Roden and Swartz, its strengths are that it's, it's extremely fast in doing its job and it also offers the highest resolutions in terms of the number of measurement points that you can use for any given graph. Which is important if you're dealing, for example, with tests that have a lot of phase shift going on or a lot of changes over relatively uh, small steps of, um, of frequency. And in combination with being able to, to do the measurement very quickly, you can really derive a very detailed graph in that type of situation. That's certainly a strength of the Roden and Swartz. What I like less about it is the graphic layout of the resulting plots. I mean, they're not wrong, um, but I wouldn't easily take such a plot and just insert, paste and copy it into a piece of, 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 of documentation. It just looks a little bit too, too peculiar or, or so in a way. Um, when we look at the Siglent, it, it's, 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 it's a bit of particular because it got great strengths, also a couple of weaknesses. Let me start with the great strength. That is certainly having three outputs of a dot can be measured at the same time. So either three different points within a given device under test or perhaps two or three different devices of test that might be behaved somehow differently or under different settings. I think that that, that, that is really a great plus of the, 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 the Siglent device. It has a wider frequency range, although for this wider range, in most of the cases, you will need to use an external compatible Siglent, Siglent uh, signal generator to, to take benefit of them. It got these measurement functions, um, but, but I'm not that excited about it for the reason that I just discussed uh, before. And I like the way the output looks. This is the type of output that, that I would be happy to copy and put them in documentation, even though if the, the resolution in terms of number of, of pixels could have been a little bit, bit better. Um, then on the weaknesses of the SDS, well, the, the first weakness that comes to mind, it's terribly slow. It takes 22 times as much time as a Roden and Swartz to carry out a comparable task. You're waiting minutes and minutes basically to see your, your, your results. Um, I'm also missing the waveform display, which I think is important in terms of a quick visual check, whether we're dealing, for example, with any distortions or clipping of the, the signal, that the auto scaling doesn't always behave properly, um, and that the scaling options are a bit odd, and that you cannot get to regular scaling like 3 dB or 6 dB scales, which at least for people in audio and looking at, 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 at power levels uh, would be preferable. Um, finally, the, um, the DSOX, 
uh, of, of, of key side, what I like. It's, it's, it's a fairly plain uh, implementation, but it, it, it works well. Um, I think there's not much really to complain about. Um, the outlooks are, uh, output is, is really good looking again, um, but also like the signal of relatively low resolution, um, especially because the screen of this device is low resolution. And you, you can basically only have like a, an, an, an yeah, a, a screenshot. He doesn't produce the graph as such as high resolution. Of course, all free instruments can export your data set and then you can reformat it in, in any way, but that's, that's quite a bit of additional work. I was hoping that they could just export a good quality graph themselves. Um, on its weaknesses, it's a bit slower than the Roden and Swarz, but that's not so much an issue, not so much slower. And the, 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 the feature set is a little bit less rich. Uh, we got only a single cursor, we don't have amplitude zones, so it might be harder to work with devices with, with, a, with a great um, dynamic range or with, 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 with certain parts in the range where they're prone to, to overloading or, or other types of things. So it's slightly less flexible. Um, but all in all, I think we can cl conclude that, that, that we can be happy with, with any of these three devices when it comes to the, uh, the body plot functionality. Now, that was it for today's um, episode. I hope you found, it, uh, you found it interesting. You could learn something from, uh, from it. And I'll be back with, uh, with later episodes because there's still many things we need to cover of these, um, these instruments as part of our review series. Thanks for looking.